what value can I deliver out there in the world with the belief that it's going to return to me tenfold. I've been waiting for for years. Uh, so, downtown Josh Brown is joining me today as the first guest on the pursuit, which I'm super excited. First episode with a guest. Um, and for those who don't know, Josh is somebody that I've looked up to for years. He is the reason that I have a blog. He's become a mentor of mine, and I know that at any moment I could have called him to ask him to join me on a podcast. But I wanted to try to bring it to a place where we get something from him that he's not talked about anywhere else. So we're not talking markets. We're not talking, you know, politics or anything else. That you, you want my, need. you want my fitness. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. It's funny fitness thing, and though, nutrition. I remember that that CrossFit blog post you wrote. That was yeah. when I first kind of found you, and I was deep into CrossFit. It's like, awesome. This dude's doing CrossFit. Um, no, we're not going fitness. Okay, we'll do that next time, though, right? There we go. Yes, yes. I have um, many thoughts. I have many thoughts. <laughs> uh, but we're going to talk about, you know, the premise behind the pursuit is pursuing what makes us most happy, helping us create the life that we really want to live. And from an outsider now getting to know Josh, you know, I can look at from when I started following you six, seven years ago to now, just like how what's important to you has changed and kind of how you've structured things, at least from the outside. So I want to talk about some of the things you've learned, that kind of arc of importance that you've been able to identify over your career and then align your life and your business to that. But before we get that, in case there is just a random person out there who has no, no idea who you are. Give us a real quick rundown of, of who you are. So I'm, I'm a financial advisor and I, I've been an independent financial advisor um, working at uh, my own RIA. Prior, I was at another RIA, but it's now this is the 11th year. So prior to that, I was a retail stockbroker and I started a blog and wrote a book in uh, Let's say I started the blog in 2008. My first book it came out in 2012. And a lot of what I spent the early days doing was just talking about the truth in terms of what's happening in the industry and why individual investors aren't being well served uh, by the, the Wall Street machine. And uh, I, that's now like a very long time ago and a lot has happened since. But uh, basically at heart, I'm somebody that really thinks that the highest level of our profession is telling people the truth and helping them accomplish what they want to accomplish. So I've, I, I think my brand is about um, transparency and saying things that maybe are unpopular, but need to be said. Uh, I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, I've made a lot of friends doing it. I've made some enemies doing it. It is what it is. But uh, basically at this point, I'm the CEO of an RIA based in Manhattan but working with clients, I think in all 50 states. And uh, we basically, I don't know, I, I could keep going. I, ha, when, does this get, when does this get boring? I feel like no. people could Google me. No, I, th I think there's something that you said that's very important in this conversation though, that you know, you're a retail broker, you saw yeah. things that didn't align with how you thought clients should be treated and taken care of, and then you began this path of moving to independence. Like, was that a, was that a hard transition for you to make? And like that basically is saying that you didn't like the way things were. You thought there was something better that lined more with your values and you went that direction instead of, you know, things. so let me, let me put it this way. I've come to learn something that many people have learned before me, but I've personally come to learn that there's no personal growth without, and, and there are no epiphanies and there are no, grand realizations or revelations without struggle and tragedy and going through difficult stuff. So I actually spent 10 years as a retail broker thinking that everything was fine. It's not like I was like, Ooh, this bad, that looks bad. You, it took 2008 for me to truly see that I wasn't helping anybody, that everything I had learned up until then was worthless or worse than worthless, dangerous, right? Uh, I learned how to sell stocks. I learned how to sell funds, right? I learned how to convince people to do transactions. I learned how to find the most speculative investors and then feed their addiction. This is what Wall Street used to be, right? Uh, 
And it, but everything seemed fine. Like clients were happy. I was happy. The market was going up. It really took 2008 for me to be in a position where I had to look in the mirror and say, what are you doing? None of this is helping anyone. So without 2008 and, and that um, economic crisis and stock market crash and all the trillions of dollars that were lost, without that, I may have come to that realization eventually. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a really, it worked out really well for me, even though at the time it was horrible. So you asked me, was it a hard decision? No, because I had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump to the investment advice side. I really want to help. However, I rebuild myself because I have nothing now, right? I have some clients, but however I rebuild, I'm going to do it the way I think it should be done now, now that I've seen, now that I've learned. So it, it wasn't that it was like hard, like a hard decision. I was really in, in a place where I, I basically ran out of things to, to worry about, <laughs> ran out of things to lose, and I just went for it. And uh, I never, once I decided, once I made that decision, no matter what, I'm doing this the right way. I'm doing this the way I want to do it. It, feel, it felt like a lot of things got out of my way. Mm -hmm. So that that crisis was very formative for my career and, and the way I think and the way I conduct myself in this industry. And I'm now I've learned to look back and be thankful for it. So as you think about kind of how you've structured things from that point on, whether it be your personal life or your professional life, it sounds like you were very intentional about when I make this change, even though I have nothing to lose, there's a certain way I want to do it. Like there was intent behind it. Are you, do you try to be as intentional with the other things you structure, structure in your life? Or is it just kind of like you, you figure things out on the fly? I'm not very disciplined. So even if I did, even if I like said, I'm going to be very intentional about everything. It, I give myself an hour <laughs> before I find myself doing something that's like a waste of time. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, a, a highly disciplined person when it comes to my own time and I need to get better at that. And I think I am right now, but I went a long time just basically like doing whatever people asked me to do, doing whatever people told me to do, um, spinning, spinning my wheels, running in circles, chasing cars, whatever uh, metaphor you want to use. I, I really did spend a lot of time and it's not that it was all time wasted, it's just that it was very unfocused. And so I needed a second crisis to come along and intervene in my life and force me to go through some painful realizations and make um, some substantial changes. And that second crisis, I think, is the crisis that we're all facing this, uh, this past year. Um, and so I would say that coronavirus, while I haven't personally gotten it, <laughs> has had a massive impact on how I'm going to conduct myself over the next 10 years plus uh, because of some very big changes that I decided to make this year. I have questions about kind of coronavirus. I'm going to end towards that because um, I'm against it. Oh, you're against it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I would, I would, I do want to go back. You talked about how I, th I think being unfocused is not a good, not a fair way to say it. Um, I'm the same way when it comes to time, like, Anybody needs something to hop on and eventually you get to a point where you can't continue to do that. I think that's one of those things where you have to, you have to experience that, that yourself. You have to be uh, generous with your time to realize how important it is eventually. I don't think that anybody's going to listen to this and say, well, Josh had trouble giving away his time too much. And so did Justin. I'm not going to do that. Like, I feel like that's one of those things you have to learn because you have to hit that pain point to be able to change and become a little bit more selfish. I think you can be, more mindful of your own time without well you don't know yet yeah you're right you have to go through it because you don't know yet what's important to you what's important to me is not going to be the same thing that's important to you or to someone else listening to this like so you're not going to figure out what boundaries you want to erect until you learn where you want the boundaries to be so i think you're right well i wrote a um I have a newsletter I write to advisors and like on the first Monday of the month, it's real big. And every other Monday is kind of like thoughts. And today I was talking about, this is perfect for this conversation about wandering, that it's okay to wander. And like, I, I'm a wanderer. And what I mean by that is I know where I want to go, but I don't wait until I know the exact next right move to keep moving forward. I kind of figure things out. So if you go back and look at my blog or my podcast or anything that I've done, it looks like I'm all over the place. 
And in some respect I am, but that being all over the place allows me to kind of find where I'm supposed to go. And like, I am laser focused now. I'll share with you later on kind of where, where things are, but like I'm laser focused now, but that's because I wandered and allowed it. And I think that one of the things I've learned is you can't be so dialed in because life never goes the, the path you want it to. And if you're only focused on one path, you're going to miss what might be the right turn you're supposed to make. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. It, there's a lot of what a lot of what I've done. There's never been a roadmap for no one else has done it. And so the wandering almost become like it's I don't want to say Lewis and Clark, but like if there's no map. If there's no set direction, then to some extent, you're forced to do a lot of things and, and learn through trial and error what ended up being a good use of your time and what didn't. Um, and so I think like there's a I think there's a benefit to spending time wandering and being curious and, you know, following certain threads where where they where they lead, even if you end up having to backtrack. But here's the thing. As you get older and as you have more people depending on you. The stakes are higher. You don't have that time to fuck around always because there are people waiting for your response on things that are important mm -hmm. or there's money that has to be made or whatever. So I think you get that. You have that 10, 15 year period after college. So let's say up until like your mid to late 30s. Then it's like, all right, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> there's people waiting for you. So um, I, I definitely – look, man. I started as an investment advisor at 30 or 31. So, and then at the same time, my public speaking took off because of the blog and the book. So like I ran around the country for like, <laughs> for like 10 years, like literally ran around the country, name a city. I gave a speech there, name a university. I spoke to the students there. I did that shit. Like I paid my dues. That's not acceptable anymore. I have too much responsibility to just say yes to everyone that's like, yo, get on a flight, come to UNC Chapel Hill and speak to the financial journalist majors. Really? How could I do that? I'd love to. I can't. Right? So there are things that you say yes to at a certain point in your career. And then as time goes by, it becomes impossible. And the thing with setting boundaries, the truth is, when you start saying no to things, the only people who get mad at you are people who were never your real friends and never really cared about you anyway. It was just only about them, right? So that's actually a really great way to weed out people from your orbit who just want shit from you. And they're not worried about your well-being and they don't actually care about their relationship with you. So setting boundaries as you get older and more established, uh, I think serves a dual function it, it's it's actually a, it's a cleanser right so um I, that being said i gotta get better at setting boundaries so that's what that's what i i think i came to the realization that i wanted to do in 20 and in 2021 there's going to be a lot more of that it's funny you say about like getting to late 30 so i turn 39 next month and like i'm at that point where I am. And you sorry. got three, and you got three kids, and yeah. you have a business. So now you understand this. Right. When you talked about people relying, like I hired another advisor last year, so now I don't have just myself and Darlene. I have Thomas that I have to worry about, and you know, getting a little bit more growth in the firm. So I think you're right, and it's almost back to the point of I had to learn that myself. I had to hit that pain point where okay, it's time to get more dialed in because there's more to lose than what I had before. Yeah. Thankfully, I did all that wandering because it's gotten me to where I'm ready to be dialed in, doing what I love the most. So it's kind of a win-win. So your your timing is exactly right as far as what you said. The other thing that I wanted to talk to, to say is, like, I am bad at saying no. And here's the reason why. Saying yes has been so good to me. And my saying yes to everybody Same. goes back to you. Um, when I was getting ready to leave the last firm I worked at, I reached out to three advisors, two younger advisors that thought were doing cool things and you. And I'll never forget, I emailed you on a Friday night, like 11 o'clock, not thinking I'd get a response because you were at this point you were on CNBC, like your rocket ship was like getting ready to get out of Earth's orbit, like you were getting out there, um, but you quite, weren't quite where you are today. So I'm like, no way I hear back from him. I'll hear back from his publicist. And uh, 
you email me. I wake up Saturday morning and I have an email. This is still you had you had your um, reform broker money. Email. Money never sleeps, pal. <laughs> you had your reform broker email on your blog still. Like that's how I got you. So I emailed it and you email me back Saturday morning and we set up a call that following Wednesday. These other two advisors were younger and they're having success. One of them blew me off and I still hold a grudge. And then the other one uh, wanted to charge me. And I'm thinking like, while they are having success, they're doing a good job. They're not having the success and they're not in like where I believe you were at the time. And you were willing to give me an hour of your time and then beyond that. So like that always stayed with me and kind of the paying it forward. But saying yes has been so good. It's brought me so many opportunities that I'm afraid if I say no, like I lose that momentum that I've had. So I've yeah, been trying one of, to like, one of the one of the things one of the things that I tell people about my career is that it was really at a dead end until I read this book called The Go Giver, mm -hmm. and I talk about this book a lot publicly. And um, I think everyone should read it at some point in their career, like early on, because it explains the power of doing things for other people without expecting anything in return mm -hmm. what that ends up doing for your career and so if your mindset is oh you want 30 minutes of my time give me 500 dollars." like if that's where you are in life that's where your mindset is um you're never gonna reach the full potential that you could reach if your mindset was instead what value can i deliver out there in the world with the belief that it's going to return to me tenfold. So The Go-Giver was a really important book for me, like just that philosophy of abundance and I can help people. And by doing that, amazing things will happen. All of it's true. Like it's, it's all true. So I agree with you, Justin. And then you have to realize though, when you get to a stage where you need to do things in a more scalable way. So you still want to give that value out into the world. You just aren't able to do it all the time, one on one, and you know, go to show up at things in person to speak to groups of twenty people like that. You get to a point where that's no longer just go giving. That's like just that a that level is not big enough to move your needle. Mm -hmm. So I think that's look. I think the pandemic did something really interesting in twenty nineteen. In twenty nineteen. I was like going to like Kansas City and speaking to 30 people. I had no business doing that. I, I could speak to a million people on the internet right now. I had no business doing that. I think that's going to change, not because of me, but just because of what's gone on in 2020. So you're going to see all those FPA meetings and all those CFA society. They may still have in-person get-togethers, but I think they'll be more comfortable throwing up a screen. And if they want someone like me to zoom in and interact with the crowd, no problem. I don't have to physically be there. It would be nice, but I, I think that that's where things are going. So for somebody in my position, it's going to be a really big opportunity to reach audiences because it won't travel won't be necessary. It'll be optional. So I think that that's a big change that's coming. And that's going to help people like you, people like me, people that are um, communicating with with audiences, you're going to communicate to bigger and bigger audiences with less and less hassle, which means you can really scale the way you use your time better. That's a perfect segue into going back to COVID. And one of the things I wanted to, to get from you is, you know, coming out of this, when we get back to normal, there'll be certain things that you'll be ready to run back to and excited to do. And there'll be other things that you're going to realize, hey, I don't need it anymore. I'm going to leave that in in the past because it doesn't really break, make me happy or, or move me where I want to go. What are a couple of the things that you are looking forward to going to do? And more importantly, what are the things of, of the past that you don't think you'll bring back into your life? Well, I really miss being in Manhattan and working with my coworkers in person. So I don't know what that's going to look like when we come back. I don't know when we're coming back. I haven't asked anybody to physically be in the office. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm basically lighting a pile of money on fire every month, but I'm in year three of a, a 10 year lease and it is what it is. It's just, just like, you know, what, what are you going to do? So, um, but we built a beautiful office in Midtown Manhattan on Bryant Park. We had people coming in from like Westchester, New Jersey, Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, like people coming together each day 
sitting together, working together, sitting in meetings. A lot of creative stuff bubbled up through that process. Uh, I don't love working alone. Like I like being with people that I learn from and respect and can help and they can help me. So I miss that and we'll get it back. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to like mandate everybody coming in five days a week. I'm not going to be there five days a week. I have other shit going on, but I'd like to be back and I'd like to have the option of holding things in person with my coworkers. So that's the number one thing. I don't care really about anything else as much as being with my people. Um, and then having, you know, having a place secondarily, having clients, uh, giving clients the ability to come in and see us, mm -hmm. drop in and see us. So we had, we had a very busy, we had a very busy office situation. We had people coming and going like it would be, it would be bananas. Like on a given day, there would be three different advisors seeing three different client families and there'd be a TV show filming in one corner, Barry giving an interview to Bloomberg in another corner. Like it would just be bananas. The elevators, it was like, it was more like a, a record label or Hollywood studio than it was um, a traditional financial advisory firm. And I, I miss that energy sitting by myself every day. So like, that's, that's my big answer to that question. I thought concerts was going to be one of them. I know you love Oh, concerts. like from a personal standpoint. Yeah. yeah. I want to go, I want to, I want to go out uh, for steaks with you in New York. I want to, I want to be at Jones beach seeing shows, you know, near my house. Yeah. I want, obviously. Um, but it'll, it'll come back. Like I, I feel like it's we're on the cusp of that stuff starting up again. So, uh, yeah, I miss. I just, I just, uh, I, I guess everyone has their things that they miss. Um, my things are pretty conventional. I think the things that I miss is probably what most people miss. Now, what I don't miss the commuting, sitting on the Long Island Railroad, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of that stuff is a means to an end. It's not a, a thing in and of itself. So, um, I'll take the good with the bad, and I'd rather be back at work. Been sitting around by myself all day. Well, you know, part of part of going where you want to go and kind of building the life that you want to live is surrounding yourself with people that move you in that direction, not pull you back or kind of prevent you from being able to grow. And you mentioned getting back with the team and being around them, but from your standpoint, how important is it for you to be surrounded around, surrounded by people who are positive and uplifting rather than? You know, I think about like social media and all the negativity that's there, and you kind of repositioned yourself out there. Like, how important is it for people to realize there's not time for negativity and people who don't move you forward and to surround yourself with people that are positive and uplifting? Well, again, I think this is a question of what stage in life you're at. When you're first building your business, uh, it becomes really important to network and meet people and, you know, be available for stuff and be you know, front of mind for a lot of people and mix it up and bounce your ideas off people. Like that's a really important phase for most people. And it just so happens that in modern life, we do that on social media. So I think it's, I think it's um, hugely helpful, especially for someone who's not in a hub of activity like Manhattan or Los Angeles. Like, you know, if, if somebody is um, somewhere where they don't have a lot of colleagues in real life to bounce ideas off of or to meet with regularly. And I think social media becomes indispensable. Um, and especially when you're in the early part of your career, trying to make connections, trying to network where, how else would you do that? I mean, so, I'm the poster child of that I'm in Fishers, Indiana. There's nothing yeah. big about Fishers, Indiana, but thanks to Twitter and networking, like yeah. my network is expanded, expanded hugely. Right. So it's the same for me, even though I, even though my career was in Manhattan, nobody, nobody knew me or cared to hear from me anywhere, either in New York city or outside of New York city until I started making a name for myself with the stuff I was writing and my public speaking, et cetera. So social media was really important, but I'm, uh, I'm 43 years old. Like I'm, I'm good. You know, like I, I'm at a point where I don't need any more friends. I got tons of friends. Um, anyone that I want to do business with knows how to reach me. I can, there's nobody on Wall Street I can't pick up the phone and call. There's probably like five people that wouldn't take my call. So I could, I could network or talk to anyone I want at this point. So um, I, what I don't want to do is have like these random arguments and skirmishes with people and upset people and piss people off. Like I, 
why would I want to put that out to the world, that, that kind of animosity? And I, I recognize that, you know, there are people that um, they're on social media with the intention to harass and troll and start fights. They may not even realize it, but it's like what they, that's the energy that, that they're full of. And that's the feedback that they want to get and they thrive on it. And I'm not here to judge them. I just, I don't want to be around that. It's that it doesn't, it's not helpful to me. So uh, I'm doing what I do. I'm running my business. Things are going okay. My employees are okay. Everybody's healthy. I'm trying to take care of my family. And anything that's like working against that goal, I can't have it in my life. Mm -hmm. So that is it's not just social media. That extends to a lot of a lot of stuff I've been watching on TV that I decided this year I'm gonna stop watching cable news. Um, there's just a, there's a whole list of things that I looked at. Um, and I said, all right, you, you were doing that in 2020 at the early stages of the pandemic, it was not helping you get to where you wanted to be. Right. Um, so like, these are the things that I'm starting to let go of one by one. And it gives me more time to do what I want to do, which is read, write, hang out with friends, raise my kids, et cetera. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like that's a very unique feeling right now. I think a lot of people are in that place where they're trying to start this year off with um, a more focused use of their time than last year. And one of the big things with last year is if you're not careful and you're not paying attention, your personal life and your work life can bleed to, into each other. And it's almost like, when do you stop working? I don't know. Because I'm sitting in the same room at 8 a.m. that I'm sitting in at 8 p.m. And I'm answering emails and it's almost like I never stop working or I'm, I'm never actually working. I'm just doing some work things while Netflix is on. Like it's very, very hard to keep those lines in place when you're at home most of the time. So I think like most people in America for 21, I'm just trying to like be more focused about how I use my time and how I segment. Okay. This is work. This is play. I think that part may have been, potentially the best part of the conversation of the cutting out what doesn't make you happy and move you forward. Like there's not, there's only so much time, there's only so much brain power we have and why waste it on stuff that is not important. What, you know, whether that's news or stuff on social media. And that's what I want people to realize is that, you know, you surround yourself with messaging and people like where you want to go and that's going to be better for, for your journey. Well, you know, there's a lot of people, they, they have this in their hand, and they do this until they find something that pisses them off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doom scrolling. They, they'll do that until they find something that either makes them laugh, pisses them off, or depresses them. Mm -hmm. And the makes them laugh part, okay, I understand that. There are better, there are better places to find comedy. Um, but scrolling until somebody upsets you, I don't understand that mentality. Mm -hmm. But there are like millions of people who are addicted to doing that. It's part of their day. They can't, they, they don't know what to fill that time with if they weren't doing that. Uh, I don't think it's that hard to break that habit if you consciously try to, but if you're not even trying, then you're just going to be one of these people that's looking to make themselves unhappy every, every day. And I can't relate to that. It doesn't make any sense to me. All right. A couple more questions and I'll let you get to your day. Um, our friend Jeremy Walter had a real good blog post called Enough, which I really liked. Um, you and I have had conversations in the past about grow or die, you know, try to keep on growing or you have trouble. Has anything over the last year, I don't think you're gonna change the desire to grow, but is there more of a, an enough for you now to where you get Ritholtz to a certain point or you get yourself to a certain point where you're like, I don't really need to grow anymore, I'm good because that next level of growth takes away from things that make me happy? No, I think we need to get bigger, um, but not big for the sake of big, big because there are things that we want to be able to do that we're going to need. We're going to need more revenue and we're going to need more people. So um, we're, we're not thinking that way at all. But uh, our growth has been extremely disciplined. I hire one or two advisors a year max. And if I don't find one that I want to hire, I hire none. So a lot of the hiring we've been doing has been non-advisor hiring people to build the the uh the foundation of the firm 
So last year I brought on a chief compliance officer and she's an absolute rock star, former regulator, um, built out this entire compliance architecture internal to the firm. This is like very important stuff that has to happen to get to the next level um, and, and be able to know that you're doing all of the things that you need to do. You get to a point where outside compliance is not an option anymore. Um, so I feel like we spent a lot of time and energy and effort um, finding the right person, supporting that person, allowing her to build out all of these systems and bring in software for stuff we were missing. Like that's not a revenue project um, directly, but indirectly it is because I now have the architecture to have another 10, 15, 20 advisors come on, no problem, and be overseen the way that, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're investing in, uh, video is another great example. How many RIAs have in-house video production, in-house podcast production? None, one, I don't know. Um, but we, we've done that as an investment because we work so hard on our content, it should look great. It should sound great. Otherwise, what's, what's the point? So we recognize that we had hit a ceiling and in order to justify all the work that we're doing, we needed somebody internally to, to run that aspect of, of what we do. So that's not a revenue uh, position directly, but indirectly it is. And now every week when I get a report of all the inbound inquiries, potential clients, um, YouTube podcasts are on that list, right? So um, we are investing as though we have the ability to be a substantially larger firm because we will be, it's inevitable. Um, the question is, can we continue to grow in a disciplined way, only bringing on a couple of advisors a year, right? Training young advisors versus buying people's books of business, you know, like 60 year old guys who are looking for uh, an exit. Do we want to purchase that? No, we're not in that business. We're about the future and growth and abundance and doing things our way. So will we stay disciplined and say no to clients who want something that we don't do? Can we, can we live up to that standard that we set for ourselves? I think we can. Um, so disciplined growth, no outside capital, 100% employee owned, don't listen to anybody. Um, the entire thing is driven by our own uh, ideas about what kind of firm we want to work at. And we don't have any targets. <laughs> we don't have any quotas. We're not kicking a, a stream of cash flow up to anybody else. Um, and I think we can keep it that way for a long time. So that's, that's what we're doing. There's no urgency. I'm not freaking out every day. Like, why aren't we bigger? Like it's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. We're taking our time and we're getting to where we want to be. So right, sometimes I freak out, um, but <laughs> but like in a, in a healthy way. All right, well, I couldn't get you on without bringing in hip hop a little bit. So what, what's the best hip hop out right now, uh, in your opinion? I feel like everyone held their shit back in 2020. Um, so you got a lot of mixtapes, but everybody held their, their albums back. I think you're gonna get new J. Cole in the first quarter of this year. Like that's, if you ask me about like new rappers or younger rappers, he's, he's already like a middle-aged rapper, but like I'm, I'm waiting on new J. Cole. Um, I think there are, I think there are like some really great singles out that they just become like a TikTok thing for two weeks mm -hmm. and they come and go really quickly. Um, so I think like over the last year, like if you say like, what, what were the albums that like kind of like stuck with you and, and were, were stuff that you could keep going back to? It's very hard because again, I think like a lot of, a lot of stuff just didn't come out and people were wise to hold it. Cause they want to tour. Yep. They want to support it. So yes, you get a new Drake record every three months. Um, but nobody else, is, nobody else is working at that pace. And I think a lot of people, um, so probably the best, the best record, the best like hip hop record of last year. I, I think I liked, uh, I like Fut uh, futures, uh, record I think came out last year. Um, is that the, the one with the wooden basketball uh, uh, backboard? What was it called? I'm not a big Future fan. I don't like Future. Yeah, it's a great like record. It. Lil Uzi Vert put out a great record over the summer, um, but then I think like a, a lot of a lot of like what was influential this year were singles on TikTok, and you know, 
and then a lot of Megan, which I have a teenage daughter, so I'm trying I'm trying not to play that in the house. Uh, I would love, love J Cole album. I love J Cole. Um, and but there's a song that I I feel I, I love. So Middle Child was on that compilation they put out, and there's a line in there that I absolutely love. So J Cole talks about being kind of that intermediate between the old school rap and the new school rap. Yeah, Middle and Child. I, that yeah, that's I I identify with that. I feel like I am the middle child advisor. Like I can relate, like I can come to you and the advisors have been there longer, but I'm also talking to the new up and coming advisors on the other end, like in the AGC and other stuff. So I feel like that song I love because I really, really like identify with it. I think I would love for Kendrick Lamar to come out with an album this year. Cause I feel like with everything that's gone on over the last couple years since he's been out, like, I just feel like it would be. Yeah, but that, so that's a great, that's a great example. You know, he has something in the chamber. Yeah. But if he can't tour behind it, you know, he can drop and people will listen to it for a week. Mm -hmm. But then some other mixtape comes out and kind of replaces it. Whereas if he actually has the ability to go out and do festivals, you know what I'm saying? Like he's, pe people forget he's already, it's already 10 years of Kendrick, right? He like he's played Bonnaroo. I think he's played Coachella multiple times. So like an artist like that holding that music makes perfect sense to me. Um so like I feel like we've, we kind of got gypped uh this this past year. Um but but hopefully that changes pretty soon. Yeah, it's all good things for the future. All right, JB, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and kind of letting us into your, not necessarily your personal life, but more into kind of how you view life and what you've learned. Um, I think it'll be you know, instrumental in the way people kind of figure things out on their own. And I think it's good to hear stories of people who had to figure it out, wandered a little bit, because I feel like that's what so many of us do. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your friendship and all that you do for advisors and also just the public in general. Um, I know a lot of people respect you. I look at the comments on the compound and everybody loves you because you are saying the truth. And I think that's pretty powerful. I wouldn't say every, I wouldn't say everybody loves me, but I'm, I'm trying to not say and do things that deliberately provoke people to hate me. I, right. I think that's, that's a better way to phrase it. I'm doing, I'm doing my best. Sounds good. All right, JB, have a great day. Everybody. Thanks for tuning in. If you're not already following Josh, we'll follow him all over the place. I'll have links to everything. Um, and we'll see you all in the next episode.